Thank you very much, David. Well, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Julia asked me to do this a long time ago, and we were trying, juggling on the, on the timing and the month, uh, but it's finally worked, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here and see some of the old faces and old colleagues. I was given uh, the topic to talk to you about laryngeal cleft. Uh, this is really not a lecture, but more of a conversation with you. Uh, I have to preface it by saying that when I was a resident, and I know they are sitting on this side, I never saw any of these, any of the cleft. And when I was a fellow, I saw one. So I will tell you the story of how this thing has evolved. But before I start, I also, you know, last week for some people who are, uh, who are, have affiliation with Triological, they heard about the passing of Dr. Stuart Strong. That was sort of announced. I don't know how many people in this room know of Dr. Strong, but sort of it happened about last week. I got an email from someone that Dr. Strong has passed away, and it really affected me. I'm just sorry. I, I'm not sure what happened here. I took some pictures of some of the people who have really affected me in my education. And uh, for those who don't know Dr. Strong and Dr. Vaughan, the whole airway and laser surgery really started in Boston because of them. I was really fortunate as a uh, medical student to work with Dr. St uh, Stuart Strong. He used to teach us. And then I was really, really fortunate to see Dr. Vaughan, two of them who really pioneered laser and airway surgery in Boston, was really lucky to be toward the end uh, of when they stopped operating. And then uh, subsequent to that, Julia knows, uh, two individuals who really made a major difference in my training with the airway was Stan Shapshi and Peek Wu when they were in Boston. And then Jerry Healy, uh, when I was doing my fellowship. And I will tell you the story of why I mentioned Jerry Healy. So this was a reflection for me of last week when I got the news that Dr. Strong passed away. And also, not only people, I mean, what I'm going to present here not only depends on what I learned from all these individuals on the screen, but the individual that I currently work with. So this is our airway program in Boston. Uh, which has attending from 13 different departments, general surgery, cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, they're all listed. I'm not going to read them. But I'm just really fortunate enough to share some of the things that is the product of all the individuals on the screen, and I'm sort of being the messenger here. So uh, with regard to the laryngeal cleft, what I told you, I'm not going to give a lecture, but more of a conversation of how this thing evolved what I have learned, the mistakes that I made during the process of the 20 years, and some of the controversies that exist by this entity. But before, let me share with you some patient stories that put things under context of going forward. So this is how we used to manage these 20 years ago. This is a th and these are all real cases. They're all my patients. So this is a three-year-old drinks with cough, has pneumonia, has remained on a thickened feet, since birth until the age of three years. These are all the swallow studies, seven months, 20 months, and two and a half years. So this patient was getting pneumonia and just being managed, and finally, one way or the other, grew out of this. So in 2000, this patient showed up. Uh, this is in Boston. I got a call from the chief of, M chief of uh, GI that they have this three-year-old healthy child who, as you can see, has had 10 swallow studies at Boston Children's from April of 2000 to October of 2002, all showing aspiration, and is G-tube dependent, has pneumonia, is, uh, and cannot drink water, coughs and chokes, and still has a G-tube. And this patient has been seen by pulmonary, neurology, brain MRI, A to Z, and everything is normal, and they don't know what's wrong with this patient. So two young patients. Now we have a 15-year-old who is now getting to the teenagers, syndromic, much more sick. You can see the outline here. Same issues, pneumonia and aspiration, and is G-tube dependent. And this patient was referred to children's general surgery to have, to have part of their lung removed. 
And if you can see on this, as you go down, this is the trachea, obviously, and then you go in, and there is no right lung. This, this is what has happened to the lung after 15 years of aspiration. And this patient was referred to have a lobectomy uh, to Children's Hospital. And as you can see, we are assessing this patient for a cleft. Fourth patient is a 14-year-old. Again, think about the age now. These are teenagers. Same issue with recurrence of pneumonia. These are all comes from out of state. Has had cardiac procedures because of pneumonia. Has had tonsils removed, adenoids removed, two sinus surgeries, and had, actually has had the right middle lobectomy before coming to us. And the last patient is this. This is a patient who comes to us. Same story again, a teenager, 50, 54 episodes of pneumonia, coughing and choking, and this is the lung. And then when you do the exam, again, this, is, this looks innocent, but I'll come back to that. This looks partially normal, but it is norm not normal. And then when you go down to the lung, you will see the same thing. You will see that chronic aspiration destroying the right lobe. And this patient actually ended up, as you can see again, same scenario. It's more on this side. It's blocked because of chronic issues. And this patient actually had the right lobectomy at Children's before we repaired the cleft. So all of these patients have something in common, and that was the cleft. So before I get into the cleft, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about swallowing disorders. i just put that in the concept because that's important, because that's something that I missed for 10 years of my practice. I was focused on cleft. I thought of a cleft as a whole, that if I close it, it will function. And I missed the boat for, the first, for one decade. And the reason I missed it is because this is what I was taught when I was in medical school. 25, 27 years ago. So we thought of swallowing as three things. We chew something in the mouth, tongue moves, palate moves, you swallow it, it goes on the back of your throat, there is an oral phase, and then you push it down to your pharynx, and then it goes to your esophagus. It was very, very primitive, the way we understood this whole swallowing concept. But then we began to think about it in more phases. We realized that not only the oral phase, but the pharyngeal phase, but the esophageal phase also play a role in aspiration. And it's not just, just, it's not just your larynx. And then we, we begin to think about this whole oral drooling and delay in initiation of swallowing and penetration and question of reflux and oral aversion. This was still much at the macro level. And then we begin to think about uh, swallowing disorder in a much more micro level. And we realize that there is so much within the oral phase and pharyngeal phase that we don't even think about or we don't even evaluate. And I don't even know how to evaluate after 20 years that can affect the aspiration. So what I was thinking in 1992 that cleft is a hole, just close it and everything comes back, is because I didn't know anything about everything that is noted here in black. And then it has taken us a decade to really fully understand that. Now, if you bring it back more at the macro level, and now think about neural phase and the muscular effect of these children, and the endocrine and the inflammatory, it even becomes much more complex. That is, the anatomy and function doesn't really go hand in hand with this entity. To make the matter more complex, again, 20 years ago, we thought of swallowing vagus and nine goes in, innervate this, innervate that, and that was our fund of knowledge. But now, at, you know, about 10 years ago or so, we begin to think about a much more complex neurophysiology that controls swallowing the autoresuscitation reflex, and more importantly for this room, the laryngeal chemo reflex. And I will just briefly go over that, specifically the second one. Just in the neonate, in the neonate period, it is amazing that there is an intra-mechanism at the laryngeal input that you can control breathing by hypoxia but CNS depression. 
and it's just whole, it has the whole neurophysiology behind it that is far beyond my conversation for tonight. But it is much more complex rather than to think of it as a cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 10. But the most fascinating part, and something that most of us, including me, completely missed the boat for 10, 15 years, is really what happens on, in that interarytenoid area, on that cleft area. If you look at it at the neurophysiology perspective, it is innervated by 9, 10, and it has so much chemoreceptors. And it is because of those chemoreceptors and the interarytenoid area that certain medication has an inhibitory and certain uh, entities has a positive effect on it. So this whole concept <coughs> that I have a hole at the interarytenoid area and I laser it and I suture it and I expect it to function is a very primitive way of thinking about it. And honestly that was my way of thinking for the first 10-15 years. <coughs> to make the concept even more complex, does, is aspiration a normal entity or is an abnormal entity? And there is a lot of data now coming that even normal individuals, normal adults, and normal children, they aspirate. There is enough data here in many years from 2000 on that says 20, more than 20% of preemies have feeding issues, more than 30% if they have BPDs, they aspirate. 20 to 80% of children with neurodevelopmental issues have feeding issues and so on and so forth. I'm not going to read all of these, but it is much more common that you and I, or at least I, expected this. But is it a normal entity? There are data to support that actually 45% of the normal children aspirate. So why don't they get pneumonia? Why is it that these children don't become 14 and 15 year old and lose part of their lung if, it's, if the aspiration is that bad? And why is it that if you are even neurologically completely healthy, you would still aspirate during the sleep? No one really knows. So that was the background that, of the swallowing discoordination. Now let me turn into the cleft itself. Why it, this is really not a new entity. And if you look at the books, they say it's 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 20,000 cases of live birth have laryngeal cleft. If that statement is correct, then what I'm going to tell you, in the past 20 years, I have overdiagnosed and I have done many unnecessary surgeries. So it's either I'm doing or we are doing too many unnecessary surgeries, or I thought maybe this statement is incorrect. But actually, it took me a while to figure out this statement is actually correct that it only talks about type 3 and type 4. I don't know how many births you have at the Stanford Medical Center here. I'm assuming it's five, six, seven thousand a year. I don't know how many, birth, uh, new, uh, how many deliveries are done at this institution. Do, we, do you guys know how many? So at Boston, at the Longwood campus, between Brigham and BI, we have about 12,000 births. And we typically see between one to two type 3 to type, type 4 a year, which goes along exactly to that number. So that is a correct number, but it is not counting type 1 and type 2s. And as I m mentioned here, on a historical perspective, this entity was really described in 1700s, and the surgery was done in 1900. So it is, it is an old entity. The problem with the cleft is this presentation. It could be silent aspiration that we'll talk about. It could be coughing. It could be strider. It could be, quote, unquote, atypical asthma or respiratory distress. So it comes in different forms, and that's why it's a little bit confusing. It is more common in syndromes that have midline anomalies, as I have outlined here. And it, it makes sense. It's a congenital lesion. So if you have midline ano anomalies, opets, waters, and Pulitzer Hall, then they have a higher chance of having this cleft. <coughs> Or if you have in children who are not syndromic but have other midline anomalies, specifically TEF. Children who are TEF, if you look at the publication, anywhere between 20 to 40 percent of them have cleft. So it's very important for you to work with your general surgical colleagues to be sure those patients are actually evaluated with cleft because typically they are intubated, they go to the operating room, they have their TEF or esophageal atresia repair, they remain intubated and they go out and then they extubate it sometimes in the future. So they really don't get a complete airway evaluation. So this is typically what happens to the lung over time. Not all of them, but some. 
So this is a patient who has, was referred to us who has had 150 chest x-rays between March of 2004 to October of 2007. And as you can see, the degradation of the chest x -ray. It was fascinating. This patient came to us through Maine. And it was interestingly, because of the medical record these days, you can actually look at these x-rays far back and see the trend of having uh, pulmonary manifestation due to the chronic recurrence of aspirations. Now, if you, we typically do not do, but in these children who come in by the age of four and they have had issues with recurrence of aspirations and pneumonia, if you get a chest X-ray, actually chest X-ray, I'm sorry, chest CT, you will see abnormalities that you may miss on the chest X-ray. So if you are dealing with the children who are being diagnosed with typical asthma, who requires inhalers, who are respiratory issues is deteriorating and are on daily dose of inhalers, multiple inhalers, it is not a bad idea to think about getting a chest CT just to see what kind of initial abnormalities you pick up and then you can alter your medical management based on this. We in, in uh, ORL slash ENT, we have really advanced. We don't manage sinuses with sinus fill, but all pulmonology colleagues still rely purely on the chest X-ray and they don't order as much chest CT as it necessary. Let me show you our, our numbers at children. Now, before, before I uh, go on, let me just show, give you, ask a question of how many people in this room have had pneumonias in their lives? How many people have had two pneumonias? That's what I did. One person has had two pneumonias. It is not a common thing. So my point to you is if, if you have a child come to your, uh, to your office and that child by the age of one or two has had four or five episodes of pneumonia, it's really not a, com it's not a normal thing. You have to look into it. Now, I, I do not suggest by any means that everybody who has pneumonia has a cleft, but having pneumonia is not a normal thing. It's not a normal entity. As, as otolaryngologists, if somebody comes to us and they, a child, and has a unilateral profound sense of neuro hearing loss, I know that pathologist, the alarm goes up. And we don't let it, we look into it. We repeat the audiogram. We do a workup to figure out why this child has a, a unilateral sense of neuro hearing loss. But if a child comes to us and has had six or seven or eight pneumonias, we, sometimes we don't take that as seriously as we should be. So these are our data for 17 years. This is 17 years of patient. Not everyone with a cleft needs to be managed surgically. You can manage a lot of them medically, 216 and 386. So I just want to show you, not getting to the weed of the matter, but some, something that I think it's worthwhile <coughs> discussing with these patients. So who gets medical management? 50% of the children who have type 1 cleft, they really do well. So for children with a small cleft, you don't need to do surgically. 50% of them, they do great. And they do great if you maximize their medical management and they learn how to compensate. And I will come back to that. So the only reason you do surgery on this, at least in my hand, is not because they have a cleft, but it is because of what the cleft has caused, either airway issues or feeding issues meaning recurrence of respiratory issues despite maximizing medical management, recurrence of feeding issues despite ma maximizing medical management. Those are the ones that require surgical. And don't rush them doing that because, as I mentioned to you, 50% of them, they do well and you can manage them uh, conservatively. What is noted here in red is I want you to pay attention. Well, I have a colleague by the name of Elliot Katz, who was one of our senior pulmonologists. He looked at our data, and he was completely blinded on who is who. He just reviewed the medical record of these patients. So type 1 and type 2, 61 to 50 percent have wheezing, chronic cough, and about 70 of 70 percent or so of them, they have abnormality of the chest x-ray that I will show you. Now, there are some of them are complex, as you can see here. 27 percent, you know, they have G-tube. TEF, about 15 percent, and about 20 percent are syndromic. So these, the ones who have surgeries are much sicker. These are not normal, healthy children who typically aspirate. 
This is the most important message of this. So what he did was fascinating. He looked at these children, even though they don't have asthma, by the age of three, based on their number of admission, chest x-ray finding, number of dose of antibiotic they have in, and the inhalers. If you use those and put it into the, the database and compare it with asthma, even though they don't have asthma, just based on their medical management, 50% of the type 1 and 39% of type 2 by age 3, they're going to have moderate to severe asthma just because of the amount of medication and admission and the ER visit and the inhalers, which is very, very impressive, which could explain why some of these children become teenagers and they have those manifestation of pulmonary finding that I showed you earlier. And if you look at their chest x-rays, even though you're completely blind to their background, as you can see here, between uh, chest x-rays and pneumonias, about 70% of them, they have abnormal chest x-rays by the age of three. Now, it's interesting, I couldn't figure this out at the beginning, why is it that the type 1, which is the more minor issues, causes more severe number, both from a chest x-ray perspective and from an asthma perspective? And the reason for that is because their symptoms is minor. They come to us far out later. Type 2s, they, they choke, they turn blue. They scare the families. They scare the pediatrician. They refer them to you much sooner. Type 1 are the ones who are just being chronically being handled. It's like that for, from an otology perspective. is that cholesteatoma that is sitting there and nobody can see it, and it occasionally gets drained, and then you put on antibiotic, and it drains an antibiotic, and it drains an antibiotic, and finally somebody picks it up, as opposed to a cholesteatoma that is smack you in the, in the face right behind the tympanic membrane. So that's the difference between type 1 and type 2. So what happens with surgeries? Do, do, do we do a good surgery? And this is my outcome. I can tell you, if I do surgery on type 1, 85% of the my patients, after three months, they pass their swallow studies. Type 2, 80%. Type 3 and type 4 are outlined. So I couldn't figure out why is it do they fail. And that's the thing that, again, we missed or I missed for about 15 years. Why is it that I do the same, same surgery on some of the kids and they do great, but 15 to 20% of the kids, I do the same thing and the suture holds, but they still aspirate. So I will come back to that. But this is the most important thing for one message that I can also leave with you. <coughs> there is so much controversy of what is a type 1 cleft and how do you really diagnose type 1 and how far does it go and how deep does it have to go to diagnose the type cleft. And I, in my mind, obviously, that's an irrelevant question. And I will tell you what I mean by that. In reality, one, in, for me, in my hand, one-third of the time, I can tell you something is a type 1 cleft. One-third, I can tell you it's not. And one-third, it's very difficult to tell. You're looking for a hole that is 25-gauge needle. It is the same size as the T, uh, tracheoesophageal fistula H type. And it's, it's a 25-gauge defect. And when it swells up, it's very hard to see. But it is irrelevant, and why is it irrelevant? For those of you who deal with laryngeal malaysia, you do not operate on laryngeal malaysia based on how it looks. You operate on it based on its symptoms. What I mean by that is, if you have a patient whose larynx looks like this, and you can't even see the vocal, that this child has a mild strider and eats okay, you do not operate on that patient. But if you have a patient whose larynx is a little bit better, but is turning blue and is choking, you will operate on that patient. Mm. So your management of laryngeal malaysia has nothing to do with the way it looks. It has to do with its function. So type 1 cleft management is based on its function. Is it causing airway issue and is it causing feeding issue? Independent of the depth of that proof. So if you think of it in that context, it is much easier to manage it. And that's why I told you 50% of them, they learn to learn how to compensate the same way that we don't operate on all the laryngeal malaysia vegetation. Only a few percentage, 10%, 20%, I don't know, depending on the institution. But majority, they learn to, how to compensate. So 
So the question that I raised earlier, why is it that we do operate on this cliff and they still have a problem with aspiration? Until we actually, we came up with, we looked at all our data and we came up with two explanations. One is, as you can see here, most of these patients are complex. There is a lot going on with them. They are syndromic. They have neuromuscular discoordination. So that was one explanation. But the most fascinating explanation was the fact that, again, I personally missed the boat of thinking of swallowing in a very primitive oral pharyngeal esophageal phase until we did this study. Now, if you look at this study, we'll, we get we got three uh, speech pathologists to review the swallowing. And if you look at the, look at the type 1 here, this type 1, this 98 patients, 27% had oral phase impairment, 42% has trigger impairment, 79% had laryngeal penetration, and so on and so forth. So the whole swallowing discoordination is off. So when we operate on the larynx, even if we do a great surgery, we have no effect on what is wrong in green. We can only fix what is wrong in red which absolutely makes sense. And 20% of them, despite our best effort, despite the fact that we close, they do aspirate. It took me two decades to figure this out. i give you a simple example. Think about the children who have cleft palate. I'm sure you have great plastic pediatric surgery. Why is it that the same surgeon closes some child palate and after the surgery, our speech is perfect? Next patient. Same surgeon, same defect. On that child, all like this, and it requires speech therapy for three years. It's the same concept. You close the hole, but you cannot give it function. So that's the issue with the cleft. So it's the same thing with the palate, and it's the same thing with the larynx. So now that I set that stage for you, what about the surgical management? I know we have some individuals here who may not be familiar with this, so let me just explain this a little bit more on the, uh, as far as what is type 1 and type 2. Classification has been controversial for decades. The most common one is a Benjamin classification. So for type 1 is a defect that is really maybe 2 millimeter, and it goes to the level of the cord. Type 2 goes through the cricoid, but doesn't split the cricoid completely. Type 3 goes through the cricoid and the cervical trachea, and type 4 goes all the way down. And this Benjamin classification was really the standard for decades. And then one of my friends and colleagues in Switzerland, Mornier, came up with this classification, which, in my opinion, is a much more um, comprehensive uh, classification system. And what he said was there are differences between certain aspects of these patients. So type 1, again, just between the cords, up to the level of the cord. Type 2 goes through the cricoid. But he said type 3, if it's only through the cricoid, let's call it 3A. If it goes through the trachea, call it 3B, because the management of these two are very different, and he's absolutely correct. And with type 4, he said if it goes to the crina, let's call it 4A, and if it involves the bronchi, call it 4B because again, the severity is different, and in my opinion, he is correct. So for the rest of this talk, let me concentrate on this classification system. It is, there are many different ways to do this, and there is really no right way or wrong way. I'm just going to show you how I think about these things and how, how, I, how I manage it. So for type one, as I mentioned to you, for me, I think of type one as laryngomalacia. If this area is deep, but the patient has no manageable feeding issues, manageable airway issues, I do not operate on them. As I showed you, we have 291 of them that we manage with medically, and they, they do well. We don't inject them, and they do great, and they will learn how to compensate. One more example that I can give you that you can, all of you can relate to it is a bifid uvula. You do not operate on bifid uvula because somebody has a bifid uvula. This is an adult with a mustache. If somebody has a uvula that looks like this, but their speech is perfect, and they have no feeding issues, you leave it alone. 
But if you have a child whose bifid uvula is just at the tip and they have gone through speech therapy for three years and they still have nasality of speech or they still have feeding issues with liquid after two years of feeding, then you operate on them. So think of type 1 in the same context. So 50%, you don't have to do anything. So what, and then injection, I know there are institutions who inject these. For me, the injection comes into place for two categories. Cardiac patient that I cannot suspend because they start shunting, or craniofacial kids whose neck is so unstable that I can't suspend them. So those I inject, but otherwise, I, in my hand, I would prefer to repair them. How do we repair them? They are done on spontaneously breathing, and we, I use a laser, some people don't, and we use a PDS and a Vicro. So these patients are spontaneously breathing. So the anesthesia is really the key. And as you can see on, on the picture, the laser has already been done. So as I mentioned to you in the first talk, the laser for this is very different than the laser for a clean larynx. So you're using a laser to weld. So you're going to do it in a de defocus mode. You really want that scar formation to happen. And typically for a type 1, we put two sutures. I usually the first suture I put in is a PDS, and the second suture that is at the level of the larynx, I use Vicro. And the reason I do that is because PDS at the larynx, at the vocal cord, it seems to me that it stays too long and it leaves granulation tissue. So that's how I do it. We don't intubate them. Uh, we monitor them in a monitor bed postoperatively. We give them steroids and antibiotic. I usually keep them 24 to 48 hours, depending on the other issues and where they live. So that's a classic for type 1. I think of type 2 as a cleft lip and palate, as opposed to laryngomalacia. So what do I mean by that? If you have a patient who has a cleft palate, but has normal speech, and no feeding issues. You still close it. You don't leave it open. So you operate on cleft lip and palate based on its anatomy, not based on its function. So in my opinion, because of risk of prolonged aspiration and pulmonary issues, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think for type 2s, they should be repaired. Because I don't know what, what's going to happen to these children's lung when they are 15 or 16 years of age. So we operate on them, and the way we do it, again, is the same method of spontaneously breathing. So these are larger cleft, deeper cleft, as you can see. It goes below. We use a laser, either in a uh, delivery mode, a flexible laser. And as I told you, you are going to see char with these lasers because using it as a welding tool, and then we put three sutures. The first two sutures, I typically use PDS. And again, the last sutures, the third sutures at the level of the vocal cord, we use a Vicro because of the risk of granulation tissue. These, they need to be monitored probably in ICU because what you are doing with these children is when you close the cleft, you're actually giving them laryngomalacia. You're squeezing the back of the larynx together. So I do feel, especially if they are syndromic and they have other issues, you should monitor them in ICU for one night and probably on the floor for one night. I, one thing I learned over the course is I used to send these kids home and some of them would come back two weeks out and they would have pneumonias. And I couldn't understand it at the beginning. And the reason for that is most of these children, they have pulmonary issues to begin with. Their lung is not healthy. And when we do these surgeries, it's a spontaneously breathing for about an hour and a half. So these kids, they are breathing like a puppy, short breath for an hour and a half. They get atelectasis at the end of anesthesia. They go home. Now, they are chronic aspirators, and they are set up for uh, pneumonia. So I, I have started using antibiotic, and I give them Zitromax, both for coverage of antibiotic, but most importantly for its anti-inflammatory. And I give them two doses. I give them five days on, five days off, and five days on. And I have to tell you, I don't know if it's me, I don't know if it's the different kids or it's the method. We haven't had one pneumonia since we have started this protocol. And I think it's important to cover them. Oh, question for you. Do you, do you think the laser is absolutely necessary? Can, can the larynx be even consolized with a cold technique? Or do you feel like the laser is necessary? I don't think so. I really don't. I think you can use, you can cut it. I honestly, you know, we were talking about this, and I showed Shabshay's pictures and Piku's pictures at the beginning. I don't know if you were here. I grew up with, with them with lasers, so I feel comfortable using it. And, I, and for me, 
uh, when I cut it, and I have used sometimes I cut it, but it bleeds a little bit. So using a laser for me, it just eliminates that uh, bleeding issues. Now there are some people, like if you talk to Peter's friend, Jean-Michel Triglia from Marseille, he actually uses a laser and sometimes he doesn't suture because he feels the laser itself can weld it. And, you know, it's sort of a belt and suspension approach. But uh, do I think cutting it with a, for a type 1 and type 2, I think it's perfectly fine. But there is another thing I will come back to. That. Because on, on the, um, are using a two-layer closure? One layer. So it's a mass closure like uh, my yeah. clumps. My yeah. Clumps. yeah, I don't do, I can't do two layers. It's been described to put a posterior closure, posterior layer first and anterior layer second. I, I, in my hand, these are thin mucosas, and by splitting it, you're going to make it thinner, and putting too much suture is there, it's actually going to rip it apart. So if you, I, I have always used one layer closure. Now, to answer your question, again, for laser, the reason I also think it's important to use the laser for me is for the deeper one, it's impossible in my hand to cut them because then it's bleeding and it just goes down to the trachea. So I think if you learn how to use a laser for the simple one, then it helps you to do the more complex one with the laser. So that's the advantage of doing it. So that's type two. So then let me tell you why, in my opinion, I couldn't figure out why type threes are missed so much. So this is a type three, and this picture is from Mornier book. So typically, if you think of cricoid, it's a ring. Now, if you imagine you take part of the ring out, it doesn't stay like this. It actually overlaps. And usually they have redundance of mucosa, exactly as you see on this pathology. So this is the classic presentation of a type three. And there is a huge hole in here. And it is interesting, some of these kids with type 3, even though there's a huge defect, if you do a swallow study on them, they pass it. Because this <laughs> tissue is like a plug, it's like a mucus plug that is closing the back of the larynx. And what kills these kids often is that they eat something solid and they push and it opens up and then now you have a foreign body going right into the trachea. And that's the, that's the issue with them. Now, this is also the, the same pictures. This is a patient with a type 3 cleft with an NG tube in place. So that's why it's important to really palpate in that area. If by looking at this, you think this is a normal larynx. Even if you look at the trachea, you may think there is some edema or redundancy here. But when you put the vocal cord retractor, you'll see the huge defect. So a proper evaluation is the key not to miss this deeper cleft. So until 2007, 2008, all I did or all we did was at least endoscopically was type 1, type 2, and small type 3s until this gadget came from MIT. And I got a phone call, I told, you, I, told you this, I told you the story of this from Stan Shapshe because he was involved with this and he asked me if I want to use this on kids and he said this just came out, this was an Omni guide and this really changed things because now you can deliver laser as far as the bronchi because it's, you have a delivery system and it's a fiber and it's really changed the whole dynamic of going deeper and doing this cleft deeper which, which I show you. But what about thinking? What's the philosophy be behind this? I do think for three A's which only involves the cricoid, you have to be sure these children have other major comorbidities, cardiac and pulmonary. Now, it is very important to have an honest conversation with the family. In my hand, these are stage procedures, sometimes twice, sometimes three times. So I leave it up to you to think about this. In my opinion, if I have a three months or a six months old infant with a type three cleft, if it was my child, I would like this child to go under anesthesia three times and have three stage endoscopic repair of the type three cleft, as opposed to making an incision, opening up the larynx, and doing an open procedure, which doesn't have a guarantee that it will heal 100% on the first shot anyway. 
So just think about that concept. And some people agree or may disagree on this, but I do feel even if you can do it twice or maybe stage it. And I would also recommend you to think about staging this. So what I mean by that is if a patient comes like this and they are striders, you don't need to completely close this on your first shot. You can stage this. And I would actually recommend to you to think about staging this because I have made that mistake myself of trying to be a hero and try to close this all the way. And if you close it, they swell up. They have laryngeal edema. They get intubated. That suture line sometimes gets dehissed and opens up. So what I recommend for you to think about is to get a three and convert it to a two and stabilize that patient. Wait for six months. And actually that patient can be on thickened feed or supplemental NG2. And you have stabilized the airway, you have avoided an open procedure, you have avoided a tracheostomy, and wait for six months and bring this patient at the age of one and do the rest of it. So that's one way of to think about it. Again, there are many ways to do this. So that's why I mentioned here staging it. And 50% of the time require more than one procedure. So how do we do them? Same thing. Now this is, this is what I, the reason I put this picture, I want you to think about anesthesia. So these are small children. What you need is a proper exposure to be sure you, get, you can get the laser all the way down. And also exposure, not only to denude that mucosa, either by cutting it or by laser, but also to suture it. So that's one thing you need. The second thing you absolutely need is an anesthesiologist who can keep them with a laryngoscope in their mouth, with their neck suspended, deep enough that you can laser the larynx and suture the larynx and don't put them in the laryngospasm, but deep enough that you, know, that you can do them, but light enough that they are spontaneously breathing. So it's a very, very fine anesthesia. So I will show you some of the... So this is a classic type 3. As you can see, the cricoid is completely open. It goes all the way down. And then the rest of the trachea is usually perfectly healthy because these kids come in very early on. These are picked up very soon. They don't wait until the trachea is, you know, has swollen and cobblestoning and all of those things. Laser, you can use both techniques. You can use a CO2 delivery system or you can use a HENI depending on the depth of the laser. Here I'm trying to figure out what, is it really the cricoid split or there is some adhesion at the depth of the uh, laser, at that depth of the cricoid. This is the laser that I told you. We usually use about three watts and then uh, denude the entire mucosa. That's the key. If you leave healthy mucosa, you are going to create a fistula. And the first suture, as you can see here, is the most critical suture. Because if you don't go to the depth of the cleft, you're going to create a TEF. You're going to close the top part, and you're going to hold at the bottom. And then they, have, they come back, and they have like a TEF at the laryngeal inlet. And then you, for these, depending on the depth, you put three or four sutures. These children, they typically should stay in the ICU for monitoring. We don't intubate them. Uh, IV steroid, IV antibiotic in-house, uh, in and go home on antibiotic. <coughs> uh, this is a different patient. Again, you can see now this is, I think we are using on the second one. Again, you, I'm going to, I'll show you. I believe you are using a flexible, yeah, this is a much deeper one. We're going to use a, a vocal cord retractor to get to the depth of the cleft. And then this is that laser that I mentioned to you. These are the delivery system with the laser. So I'm not doing the top part of it. We haven't even done to the depth of the cleft. Now you'll see, even despite everything looks like it's been lasered, you can see here, this is the key part. This is the part that you absolutely need to laser. And that's why I was mentioning to you about cutting that part is a little bit hard. And if you don't denude that mucosa, it's going to create a fistula. So those are for threes. What about three Bs? Now we are getting into the trachea. That becomes much more complex. The exposure is much more difficult. So the, with these patients, the first question that you need to address is, do they really need a trach or a G2 for some other reason? For example, some of these kids have esophageal atresia. They need to have a G2 regardless, or they have cardiac issues, or they are vent dependent and need to have a trach. If that is the case, then you can, when you do the trach, you can approach them and do them via an open approach. That's given. It makes it a little bit more challenging 
to give them the proper if, uh, advice if they don't need a trick. So then the question is, again, what I mentioned to you. Can you stage this to avoid a tracheostomy? And by that, what I mean is, in my hand, if I try to do, go from here and close it all the way up, in my hand, it will fail. In my hand, this patient will end up with a trach. However, can I take this and close this from here to here and make it a safe airway and wait for a few months and then go back and do the rest of it? And that's a concept that some people think it's a right way and some people think it's not the right way. I leave it up for you to decide. But I think in my mind, if I can avoid doing the open approach, I would do it because there's also a failure rate, and I will show you that. So again, if you need a trach, do it open. If you don't need a trach, think about staging it. It is impossible to do this in my hand in one shot deal. If you are going to close it open, then that's where uh, Peter was asking me, that's a two-layer closure because that, these are, for those, you really need to do a two-layer closure and you need to graft it, and I will show you how. And I would really recommend you to set the expectation correctly with the parents because they need to know this is a long haul. This is revision and a revision, and it's a long story with this. It doesn't end by one surgery. So this is how it's done endoscopically. This is a patient with a... You can see there is no airway. This patient was previously trached. The trach is removed. The trachea is completely, you don't, you don't see a ring. That's the status of the trachea. There's nothing normal with this airway. And that's the defect that goes down to probably ring two-ish, if you will. I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to run both of these because these are two different patients. And you can see on the top one, the laser has already been done. The same technique that I showed you. And the key is, as you can see on the top one, to go to the depth of the cleft. And on the lower screen, you're going to see the same dynamic again. It's a CO2 laser delivery system that allows you to get to the depth of the cleft. And that's the key. And getting rid of all the redundant mucosa. If you don't get rid of that redundant mucosa, you're going to have mucus plug in the airway, and they're going to need a trach. They can't breathe. You close it, but you're going to narrow the airway. And as I told you, the key is to have exposure to be able to put the sutures. So the smallest sutures that come in PDS and Vicro is an 11 millimeter, which is still huge. But it is what we have, and that's the largest suture that we can use. And they take, do okay, and they look well, and sometimes you have the hissen, and sometimes you have to go back and do them. But, you know, they, some of these kids, they grow up, and they get rid of this patient I forgot to mention to. This is an oxygen tank that she used to carry because of her pulmonary situation, but she has done so far. So far, she has done well. How far have we been able to push this? To ring four on an adult. This is a kid who, before I showed you, this is a 19-year-old child with an esophageal atresia that was repaired 19 years ago, has been in other institutions under anesthesia 40, 50 times but was really never evaluated with a cleft and was NPO. But I will show you the airway. This is definitely not a normal airway. This is a cleft. It goes all the way down, ring four. This is the esophageal atresia. That's a proline suture that was placed 19 years ago. Now, we were, I was both lucky and fortunate, or whatever you want to call it, that I was able to get proper exposure to do this. Not all of the kids allow you to do this. And as you can see, I fashioned the laser, the needle uh, from a curve, an 11 needle, to a Keef needle to be able to run this from the base all the way up. And we run this, and it took. It was really just pure luck. I don't think this, you know, this works all the time. But my point is, if you have adequate exposure and proper anesthesia, sometimes you can get away with it. Now, for the last two minutes, let me just talk about the open. These are, these are not endoscopic, but open, and how do you do them? Four type fours that goes all the way down or to the, to the crino or to the bronchi. These are, this is a friend of Peter and my, uh, myself, Noel Garabidian from Paris. He described this, and I think it's, in my mind, it has changed how I do this, and using a tibial periosteum. So the way you do this, this you, open, you do an anterior commissure incision all the way down. You open the anterior wall of the trachea, 
you're looking into the defect posteriorly. You split the edge of this redundant mucosa into two. So you get two layers. Initially, you close the esophageal layer all the way up, like the way it's been done here. Then you put a tibial periosteum over it as a graft, like the way it shows here. And the reason tibial periosteum, because it gives it rigidity. And it really, it, in my hand, if the one that I have not used, it opens up. The one I have used, they have done well. So I, I always use it. And then once you put the tibial periosteum there, then you close the inside layer, which is the tracheal layer. So these should be done in two layers, otherwise it won't take. So this is a fascinating patient. For those of you who know Jerry Healy, this was Jerry Healy's patient, 1999. This patient is from New Hampshire. This patient had a trach, and as you can see, he's an adult. Trach and a G tube, and had, I don't know how many pneumonias, I can't tell you. But this patient walked around with this cliff for about 21, 20 years. So this is the same approach, skin incision, anterior wall of the trachea is open, you're looking posteriorly into the defect of the trachea into the esophagus. This is the tibial periosteum that I told you as a graph, and we went from this hole into the back of the trachea to this area that has been closed. So that's the open approach, two-layer closure. Now, this patient was an adult, but now we do these kids on bypass. And the reason I do them on bypass, because then there is, the, there is no concern with this saturation. It's a much more stable cardiopulmonary situation. And what I also want you to pay attention is to this. This looks normal, but when you really probe it, it has a huge defect on the back of the trachea. Same approach again. Anterior wall is open. This is the posterior wall of the trachea with a huge defect. I use, use the esophageal bougie to go into the esophagus, which is colored, and it outlines the size of the cleft. And then we, again, do the same thing, two-layer closure with a tibial periosteum. So we go from this hole to this hole. And I will end with this case. And that's why I said not all the open procedures are successful, at least in my hand. This is one of the most complex patients in this series. This patient had esophageal atresia, had one single ventricle, had a type 4 cleft, and has a lot of other things that you can read. And let me just show you the airway. The only reason this child survived birth was because of its esophageal atresia, because basically it was breathing through the trachea and esophagus simultaneously. So if you look at, let me just hold off on this. And show you this. So this is the endoscopy. Let's just go all, we go all the way down and then this is the carina and there is no posterior tracheal wall. It's completely open. This is looking into the esophagus. The entire wall is missing and this is a, a oral gastric tube just basically sitting there and it's coming to an end. So this patient was basically breathing through the esophagus and the trachea simultaneously. Now I went in and I put the first tibial periosteum, which failed. And the reason it was failed, because of the mistake I made, I did not track this patient. Let me just come back and show you this. So this is after the first surgery. So you can see the lower part is healed, but the middle part just dehissed completely. And I had to take this patient back again, open up the chest by cardiothoracic, bypass and we put the second patch in and it finally took. And this is the lower scope shows you the airway now. Now the patient is trick and that was my mistake that I didn't trick this patient on the first one and now it has completely closed. So my point being is some of these patients are complex <coughs> and there is failure rate both with endoscopic approach and an open approach. I wondered when I was managing this patient, honestly, if you are actually doing the right thing. And that was a lesson for me. This patient, there is everything wrong. There is not a single organ that was normal. But this patient has grown and grown. And I get this picture from mom and dad, and they are very happy. And is turning to be a normal, healthy child, still trach dependent. I think the trach is going to be there for a long, long time before it comes out. But sometimes, this, you know, and children are different. It's amazing, despite our best effort. They do well and they heal.
So I thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop here, and uh, I know we have a few minutes for questions. I'll be happy to answer. Your questions.